Hi folks, this is International Master John Watson, and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. We're two, running two hours later today and from now on, hopefully to get some, some audience of people who've actually gotten home from work or school. Uh, the main idea of this show is to provide players with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. This is a, a very broad, wide open, wide open show. We're going to take questions both in advance and during the show. You'll notice that there's a chat window on the right of your screen, and if you're uh, logged into YouTube, which most of you will be anyway, automatically, if you have a Gmail account, for example, uh, you can participate in the chat, and if not, please log in by using the YouTube login procedures. It's uh, almost an instantaneous process. It's not a lengthy process. So, um, I hope you'll want to ask me questions. Now, mostly I'm getting questions in advance. Uh, at any time during the week, you can send questions. There are three ways to do this. One is my email address, my ICC email address, askimwatson at chessclub.com. Um, askimwatson is A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com. Just send any question. The nice thing about email is that you can ask lengthier questions, uh, and I consider them carefully. We also have a Twitter channel, hashtag askimwatson. Anytime you feel like it, you can send a tweet to uh, hashtag ask I am Watson with a question for the show. And finally, you can send a message to my ICC handle, John L. Watson, which is spelled above uh, you on the board here, which is uh, black, on the black pieces. It says John L. Watson, and that's my ICC handle. So, and then the alternative, as I say, is to ask a question right now during the show. We've gotten a lot of questions about openings, which I'm fairly, ex have a lot of expertise in. And um, I'm actually getting a question on ICC itself. That's, that's uh, <laughs> this is complicated. Try and put that on the chat channel if you can. Uh, maybe I'll try to get this anyway. Please don't, don't send me a tell on ICC right now because I won't even be looking at the ICC thing. Try to sell it on, at, on the chat channel. Um, however, the John L. Watson handle uh, to message that is good if during the week or beforehand. So I'm getting a couple of those questions. Um, maybe I'll see if I can answer those first, just because he's nice enough to have sent that. But I think he, in other words, please don't send me things on the ICC chat. On the, don't message me on ICC right now or give me a tell on ICC right now. That would be for during the week. Um, okay. Well, what the heck? Maybe I can do, I can do this anyway. Let me um, see. This is a Flaneur 68. What are the critical lines of prep for Black in the modern Benoni? F4 Bishop B5 check. H3 Bishop D3. Oh, to prep against for black. Oh, what do you need to prepare for? And uh, the second one is, do you think Carlson is in some sort of creative crises with his two recent losses at the European Team Championship? Uh, I think I'll answer the second one first. I, I really seriously doubt that. I mean, he's still Carlson. And I think, I don't know about a creative crisis. I think, I think he might be slightly unmotivated. It's a little difficult when you've been world champion the highest rated player in history, All you're, you're expected to finish first in every tournament and pretty much finish win every game, and it's uh, or at least draw. Uh, you're not even supposed to ever lose a game. It must be a little tough at some point, and uh, it's I think. But my opinion is it's no, it's no disaster yet. Now, as far as preparing against the Benoni, uh, or preparing the Benoni, what lines are critical? Well, okay, first of all, let's talk about move order. This is the modern Benoni he's talking about. The modern Benoni goes like this. We have a question about the check Benoni, actually, that came in. Um, and here, and then here. Now, with this order, uh, White has a lot of good systems. Uh, and one of them is this one that he mentions. It's the one I play myself as White, which is it's uh, sort of old-fashioned, but uh, still very, very good. It's... Um, Kasparov used this a lot. And, and Black... Now, there are funny things you can do against this. You can play moves like that and uh, allow moves like e5, and that's very messy, but I don't really recommend it. I think if white's well prepared, it's not a very good line. So the traditional move is here, and then what, what Kasparov did, and you can you can make moves like this and this, and they're quite interesting moves, but what Kasparov did is he, he slowed down the queenside expansion by playing a4. And so, yeah, you do have to prepare against this. Uh, there are two particularly interesting lines. One of them, um, you play the knight out to this square, Topolov has played that way. And then another one that's in 
my book is to play check and then come back to either e7 or d8. Maybe d8 is a little bit better. And the idea is you've weakened this side of the board a little bit. Um, now, the really handy answer to this question is that this is another way you can get into the Benoni. Um, well, let's just look at it this way. For example, if white plays knight f3 here, that this position comes up a lot. And the reason this position comes up a lot is because black can get into the Benoni selectively. He can play this move, and then instead of playing c5 immediately, he can play this move here. The idea is that if white plays here, maybe he wants to avoid that line we just looked at, that line with f4 and bishop b5 check, and he'll just play an, another opening, like say maybe the Nimzo Indian, which is very solid, or maybe the Queen's Gambit uh, are two possibilities. So, so he's willing to play those openings against knight c3, but if white plays here, he's maybe not so happy with the Queen's Indian or the Bogo Indian. Maybe he doesn't want to play those, or even the Queen's Gambit declined. And so there, he, he might now play the modern Benoni. But the knight's already committed to f3, so there's no longer the systems we just talked about with e4 and f4. Okay, so you get this position anyway, this modern Benoni position here. White might play here. And now white has a lot of choices. I would, I would also prepare in this line against um, two, two moves. One is bishop f4, just because it's really popular right now. And you can play a6, or you can play bishop g7, which allows this line queen a4 check. I tend to think black's okay on these lines, but you have to prepare. And um, uh, that would be one line. And the other line that you need to prepare for, well, of course, you always have to prepare for a classical kind of move like that, which is not very popular right now. It's not really considered very critical not right now. You can just look up the theory. There's a couple of good, good ways to play against that. The other line that's very, very popular, because for one thing, white gets it by playing the move g3 early a lot of times, is this move g3. And so you need to have a weapon in this position. I tend to like these lines where you play rook here and knight out. I think they're fun. Um, you know, this kind of move. And then if they play here, you play knight e4. And it's very, comp very, very messy. But there's so many options here. You can always just play normal Benoni kind of setup with here and here. And then the queen goes to one of these squares, you play knight e5, and eventually you aim for the b5 move. And if you're familiar with Benoni ideas, you'll recognize that plan. I kind of like the rook e8 one better, but that's that's just maybe a matter of taste. Um, what else? Oh, so just to repeat the main point, and then I'll, I'll get on to another question. The main point is that if you play this right away, you have a lot of new things to meet. And I'll show you a couple others, too. The, the problem is the f-pawn, white hasn't played knight f3 yet. So you may not want to play against some of these systems. Here's another thing, is that white can play these same-ish-like systems, since the knight's not on f3. And some people don't like playing against these, maybe with the bishop here or the bishop here. Uh, white can also play lines like this, like I think Shandorf recommends this in his book, playing not sure about it, don't, don't quote me on that, but this system is relatively popular. And, and because the pawn hasn't moved yet, white has a lot more options. And uh, this, this pawn is very well defended. I think black's fine in all these lines, but he has to know what he's doing. And as I say, a very dangerous one is the one that he mentioned, which is this, this idea. And this is enough to discourage a lot of people from playing c5 on the second move. Okay, thank you, Flinner68. Next time, try to do that in the chat channel, if you could, please. Uh, on YouTube. This show is on YouTube, by the way. Okay, what do we have here? Hello from Omaha, uh, on the chat channel. More specifically, should Black have something entirely different prepared against Knight C3? Oh, so this, his name is actually David Franklin. Um, is blindfold chess good for calculation training for someone rated? Oh, should, yeah, okay, very good. More specifically, should Black have something, sorry, I should repeat what he said. Should Black have something entirely different prepared against three knight c3, i.e. the Nimzo, and that's what I was just saying. I would say yes, unless you want to put a lot of time into things like the f4 or the f3 lines are also difficult. You, you need to, the minute, if you don't have knight f3 in, there are, yeah, there's a lot of different problems. So you can save yourself a lot of by learning some other line against knight c3. But the other way to do it is just take the bull by the hand learn, learn uh, the bishop b5 check lines well. There are systems for black that are, are playable. OK, then we have, is blindfold chess good for calculation training for someone ready?
Okay, let me see what's going on here. I may be on again. There's a delay. I believe I'm on again. Um, where were we? We were talking about... Oh, yes, this. So that's the Benoni question. And yes, you might want to avoid this by playing the order with knight f6 and e6 and wait for white to play knight f3. Blindfold chess. I think blindfold chess is probably wonderful training. I didn't do it myself, but it's something that I think is an excellent, uh, excellent training method. Now, for calculation, I'm not so sure. I think you can train for calculation just as easily with the side of the board. Um, there's no reason you can't calculate ideally. Uh, there's there's not, no reason blindfold should help you anymore with calculation, I don't think. It's more familiarity with the board and forcing you to concentrate. I don't think it's particularly relevant to calculating abilities, but that's just my feeling. It's more relevant to just understanding the board and being able to think about chess and keeping positions in your mind. And I suppose knowing where all the light and dark squares are. <laughs> so um, good question. And I, I think, it yeah, it's a good thing to bring up. We haven't talked about blindfold chess. A wonderful book by Elliot Hurst about blindfold chess. Big, huge book published by uh, McFarland. I recommend it highly. What do you think about the area Gambit and the Trash variation of the French? I always like it when they tell me what the moves are because I don't know what the area Gambit is. Okay, knight f2, uh, knight d2, knight f6, bishop d3, c5, c3, b5. Oh, yes, yes. I've seen this before. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a funny one. Yeah, I don't think it's that bad. It's a little better than it looks. Uh, it's not the sort of thing you're going to see a lot of professionals playing, but uh, it's one of the better completely crazy moves. Wonderful question. Um, most people have never seen this. <laughs> okay, uh, and now b5. Okay, so I don't know if you know the moves leading up to this position, but they're absolutely standard and have been played in literally 100,000 games or more. This move is almost never played. And the idea is that if white takes it, which is, if white doesn't take it, you've got a nice queenside attack going. You're attacking this pawn chain in very thematic fashion, and you can follow it up with a5 and bishop a6, for example, and get a real nice attack. So it does. It, the, the move definitely has a point. You might even play c4 uh, and b5, b4 at some point and just attack on the queen side. So the question is, what happens if he takes that? And what happens is black starts attacking, I hope I get this right, I think immediately with this move. It's been a long time since I've seen this, which puts pressure here and attacks that. And he's going to play knight c6 also. And maybe even play bishop a6. So he has a little bit of pressure here on the b2 pawn. And he has pressure on the d4 pawn. And I remember looking at this at some length uh, and deciding that you really can get some play almost no matter what. I think I, think I remember this move queen a4 as being one of the big moves. And um, I wish I had some concrete analysis for you. This might be the sort of thing that I can answer next week if once I really studied it. Uh, but it's also the sort of thing that maybe we can... Um, that maybe... Um, yeah, I can think about it a little, too, <laughs> and just think, what well, what are the best answers? Find out what the main lines are. Um, here, you could just chase this away and put more pressure on the center, I suppose. And uh, you notice if, if white ever takes that, of course, you've got your pieces coming out really fast. You're on this, you're on this. Um, and I, I don't want to give a lot, I don't want to try and give details because I don't really remember, and I probably get it wrong, and that would just be um, deceptive. I don't remember what else he can do here, but it's kind of a fun, it's a very fun line. I remember thinking that maybe White can squeak out an advantage in some lines, but if he tries to hold on to his pawn and develop slowly, then it's remarkable how much trouble uh, White can get into. So it's called the Aria scam, but I didn't realize that. It's, oh, here we go. It seems that Black gets enough compensation. I should read the chat. You're giving me more analysis than I um, than I know. Uh, queen b6, queen a4, you do give queen a4. You give a6, which is what I finally came up with. I was trying to think of some other way to play this. Bishop d3, knight c6. Well, that's what I just gave. Thank you very much. I actually came up with that myself. Uh, followed by bishop b7 and f6. Or, yeah, maybe maybe you don't even need bishop b7. Maybe you can play f6 right away. Or maybe they're going to be funny g5 moves. I mean, if the knight comes here, for example. There are a lot of possibilities here to make this more, uh, to get to get an active position. Sometimes you can retreat the queen and then put a knight here and chase this guy away. Chase him away from defensive d4 and just get more active. So there's all kinds of active ideas. Do you have enough for a pawn? I'm not sure. Probably some top player would tell you not quite. But I think, uh, I mean, this looks very logical. I guess, I guess one thing you can do also is try to play for this kind of trick here and, you know, this, this kind of thing. 
my timing was probably awful there, but maybe not. Anyway, something like that. Um, and otherwise, no, but f6 is so logical. Um, I don't know about bishop e7 right away. What would be another way to play this? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Maybe a5 right away? Because I'm not really scared of the bishop coming back. He's, he's wasted a lot of time, and a5 is a useful move anyway. You go there, chase him away again. You might have a bishop a6 really soon. Make it hard for him to castle. Oh, this looks actually very promising. So maybe a5 is a thought. Bishop e7 was the, the suggestion. f6 might be a little early, but I'm not that convinced. If he plays a move like this, what's going to happen is you're going to try to get pressure. Oh, let me just show you. Maybe here, and if he castles into it, he's going to lose a pawn is the idea. Something like this. And even if he didn't lose a pawn, there'd be this issue with, um, with the f file. But we'll worry about that later. Directly, there's a problem with the pawn hanging. Fun, fun line. Yeah, I think it would be worth trying. Um, you know, if I'm playing maybe one of the top players of the world, I'm <laughs> a little worried about it. But um, here's a question from Big Karpov. What about one knight c3? A wonderful question. Uh, this was one of my favorite openings for a while. I actually played it. Not much, but I did play it and with success for a while. What, the one reason it's one of my favorite openings is not because I'm a big expert on it, but because uh, it's uh, got so many transpositional possibilities. It's so lively and it's so original. It's so different. Most people don't consider this move. In fact, this is the main answer. And if you think about it, we have maybe four books now about this position. <laughs> so, so if we have four books about that position, a tempo behind, you'd think more people would be interested in playing uh, Knight C3. But of course, your goals as white are a little different from your goals as black. But nevertheless, it's a fun move. Now let me talk about this briefly because I, I think it's really fun. The two main moves, of course, are, are black taking over the center. There's also c5. As, well, there's quite a few moves that are of interest, but we'll start with the two in the center. If he plays e5, one thing you can do is you can just play a Vienna game and study that. But if you want to stay on original territory, you can play this move, attacking here. If black plays passively, you just break in the center, and this is a good version of the, and you can also go back and do a Philidor, which is kind of fun for white, I think, and then just play d4 next. But you can also break immediately, and you have a, sort of a standard kind of space advantage here, and you can play e4 next. And uh, this is a, a good version of the Philidor. Well, it's sort of a normal version of the Philidor. Or you could maybe not play e4 at first. You could maybe Fianchetto or something. I think I would play e4 next. So that's not considered good. So what black almost always does here is plays this move. And then um, white can now transpose again to say a four knights variation, something like that or that. But the fun part again is to try and stay original and play this move. So now we have something like a scotch game except without e4 in yet. If it was white's move here, he'd play e4 and he'd be a tempo ahead of a scotch game. So black anticipates that. He wants to get back into a scotch game by playing bishop e4 here. This, I have always thought, is a pretty harmless line and just equal. Good players have tried playing white here with captures and bishop g5 and queen f3 and all these moves, but it's it's considered dead equal and um, has been for 120 years. So. so how do we avoid that? Well, we can play this interesting move. Still not committing to e4. If it was our move, we'd play e4. <laughs> uh, so he needs to do something. And probably bishop b4 is the best move. I think that's probably true. If you play a slower move, for example, like that, you do have to deal with this, which is at the very least going to win the two bishops because that's hanging and this is attacked. And if he castles or something like that, I wonder if there's an immediate crushing variation because, well, not crushing, but very strong because that's a horrible, horrible uh, kingside for black. But this doesn't really avoid it because of this. I hope that's right. Are there any checks or tricks? No, this is very nice, actually. So um, that's why black usually plays bishop b4. I think after this, pretty much the same thing happens. If he plays uh, bishop c5, excuse me. If he plays bishop c5, I think... Uh, now, this I'm not totally positive. I should have gone back and checked my, my notes. You can just play here if you want to. Nice solid move, because there's no longer a pin on this knight. So you've got nice central control. If you want to get ambitious, I'm kind of wondering if you can do this anyway. But you have to deal with this check, and I'm not so sure. Oh, what a mess. Probably works for black, so I don't think we will play that. Probably just e3. Um, what else could you try? You can always take this and, and try to just follow that up logically with e3 in development and things like that, or even e4. e4 in development looks very interesting. So that's something you'd have to look up as the bishop c5 line. I think he just e3. And... Um, 
of what else is. Oh, so let's look at Bishop b4, the natural move. And here, White has some interesting things to do. He takes here. And the idea is you want to capture towards the center usually. This end game has some problems. Even if black takes this first, and this has been studied by some people, this position's a little awkward for black with his king in the center. It's true that white's pawn structure is probably even worse than black's, but he does have this majority coming down the board, and he has two bishops. And he has, the, he has tempo gainers with things like check. Um, so it turns out that this position is, I think, a little better for white. I think everybody would agree with that. You can just play f3... E4, bishop C4, and bring the bishop back if you have to to a good one of these good diagonals. Maybe maybe it'll come this way. And uh, I think I think you'll like playing the white side of that. So black almost always naturally plays this way. Now usually he still has his bishop here because in this position you have a couple good moves. One is you can just develop, nothing wrong with that. The other is you can bring the queen up and think about another kind of ending there, but mainly thinking about just E4. So white's got, a, I think, good chances there, good interesting things to do. So the main line would be actually just leaving the bishop there. But again, queen d4 hits this and thinks about doubling those pawns. And if black retreats, then we take over the center. And we have a nice, fun, typical e-pawn game, completely original position. Black's probably OK here, but this is what we want, right? It's, a, it's a, uh, an original, interesting position that probably favors white slightly, but I, I don't know for sure. But I think this would be great fun. Okay, so that's knight c3. Let's go all the way back. That's knight c3 e5, a way to play originally. Well, what about knight c3 d5, which is the main move? The most popular move against this, there's various ways to play this, but the most popular move is this. You can try to get some knight's tango-y kind of thing with that. Then you're a tempo ahead of uh, this reverse position here, but I think black's equal. But um, this is the main move, and you might say, boy, that's, that's kind of depressing because black's all ready to do things against that. One thing black can do now is play a French defense, but maybe you're happy to play a French defense. So knight c3 might come in handy. Maybe black didn't want to play that. Also, you have this sideline, which if you know well enough can be very interesting, um, that instead of playing d4. If he plays there, we're thinking of, uh, we can go into Karakan, just a normal Karakan, or in this case, you can do some interesting things. Um, one of them, let me see if I can get this right, one of them is to play this first without committing to d4. And of course, he has this move. That's that's a normal two knights, but you can study that. Uh, their players have played some interesting things in this position. Let me see if I can get this straight. I'm sorry, whoops. Let me see if I can remember what some of those things are. There are moves like there's queen f3 and queen e2 kind of moves. Queen f3 is very interesting. Just attack this. You want him to block off his own bishop. Or if he plays knight there, of course, you're going to gain that tempo and get a very original position. And if he takes, which is certainly the natural move, then you have this move. And then if and then you're not going to play this fast, maybe. You might play instead bishop c4, for example. Um, let me see if I can come up with an example of that. Maybe um, this would probably be a pretty good move. Now, you could play d4, of course, but the other way to do it is to set up like this. Oh, wait, knight, knight e5, excuse me. Probably here you'd play d4. What, no, I'm trying to think what the unique positions are here. Let me go back a little bit and see what else. I mean, here, really, you just uh, black has surrendered the center a little bit, so white's probably going to be pretty happy. Um, what else does black play here is the question. Oh, he can play d4. But then you gain a tempo, threatening this. And which is maybe not immediately mate, but must be awful, right? Let's make sure. Uh, here, here, and then we just take here because we've got bishop f4 and rook d1. If this isn't winning, I'd be amazed. Uh, the king could run over here, I guess, but that's unbelievable. Okay, so you can check that out yourself. I think you'll be happy. So he plays, um, he can play knight f6, in which case you might, I'm not so sure that how good that is, but you could always just retreat the knight. And he can play a natural move like this. At which point you simply go back here, play d3, get a nice solid game with plenty of your weight. You're three pieces ahead in development right now. So I'm sure that black's fine here because he has a nice looking center, but white's fine too. And it'd be an interesting game. Knight c3 is just a great, great move. Okay, so normally then black doesn't play c6 or e6, or, or maybe that's not the most critical line. He would play something like this. White goes back. And now we're thinking of a lot of things. One possibility is a King's Indian kind of setup with d3 and bishop g3, maybe f4 before knight f3, so you don't have to move the knight twice. That's one possibility. The other possibility is something like, just for example, if he plays a move like this, sometimes white will go there so as to get the bishop out in front of the pawn chain. 
then he can play f4 or or wait. Just play knight up and over and then eventually play for f4 because black will probably have a pawn here. That's a fun line. That's an interesting line. I think black's fine again, but white's fine too. And it's, uh, it's an interesting line. So there are a couple ways to play this position. Now you might say, well, what happens if he makes a less committal move? Or what happens if he's a Sicilian player? And I had this twice in tournaments actually here. You could just play a closed Sicilian. That might be something you're familiar with or enjoy. But you can also play... Now I have to think what I did play in this position. I believe I played knight f3. And at the very least, you're trying to force him into a, a Sicilian that he doesn't like. For example, a lot of players don't want to play knight c6 this early because they're knight off players or something. And if they're knight off players, then you have a new option, which is to play this move. And then all kinds of fun things can happen. But basically, you're, you've gotten out of, you haven't played e4. So you've got a new kind of, you're going to have better development, and he's going to have a central majority. So, and you might even think about taking with the queen here. I think I, I think I used to take with the knight, but you can you can also take with the queen, and then just make a good queen. Know about that? I think it's played really a lot. I mean, if you look at it, even okay, there are two two main answers to e4 to top level. Right now, this is super super popular. A little while ago, the French was almost as popular as it was, and um, this, of course, dominated practice for years and still is one of the top two answers. Um, so one answer to that question is mostly the top players play those two moves and they don't play anything else. They don't play the Karakan hardly at all anymore. They don't play the Elyakins. They don't play uh, the Peerts and they don't play the Modern that much. They play all those things and they're all sound, but they don't play them much. The third most popular move by far is the French. So it is played a fair amount, even at the very top. Almost every top player has played it a little. Caruana likes it quite a bit. He's certainly a top player. Nakamura played it uh, several times. Uh, I don't think he's playing it right now. Um, but he may still play it some more. Anand played it quite a bit. Ivanchuk played it a lot. Ivanchuk and Caruana were probably the two main. Rajabov, who was ranked, what, number three in the world, briefly? He uh, played it. Morozevich played it a ton. He was ranked number three in the world. Um, uh, yeah, no, we have, we have quite a lot of French at the top levels, but it is also true, it's a good question, because E5 and C5 absolutely dominate uh, practice compared to anything else. But the next by far is the French. Carlson has played the French, beat Karyakin in a game with it. I think I got asked this question before. In fact, you can hardly name a top player who hasn't played the French. Well, Galfand, I guess, and uh, probably Lecco. Um, but uh, so that's my answer to that, is that it's still played at a top level. It's not as, it's also played, as someone pointed out the other day on online, uh, it's played by in, an enormous numbers of 2,600 plus players and lower 2,700 players. And I guess those are pretty top level. From my point of view, those are pretty top level. Um, yeah, so I've been asked to say this before. Avoid saying a move like this or go here. And video is not always synced. I think most people don't, can't follow just me saying the moves in notation. You really should be looking at the board. I haven't had the complaint about the video. But I will try to, I'll try to give moves more often. I, I was asked to do that before once. So I will take that into account, but I may not do it all the time because you should be watching the board and you should be seeing the arrows. And that's, I think visual learning is a lot better than listening to moves, the names of moves. If you really want to see the names of the moves, you'll notice that they're in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. But I guess if there's a video problem, I understand your problem. I understand that's an issue. So I will try to do a little better on that. I'm not so sure if I'll succeed, but, but I'll give it a whirl. Okay, now we don't have any more chat questions right at this instant. So now I got, as usual, I have a whole bunch that were sent me before. Let me let me get to a couple of those. Um, I want to correct something from last week. This is so embarrassing. Um, I was making some answer about H3 lines in the uh, King's Indian. I don't know if any of you were watching or remember this, but. Um, we were talking about not playing uh, playing h3 here, and then not playing knight f3, but playing bishop g5. And I just mentioned, I think because of, uh, I'm not sure, but talking about general ideas, uh, that and, and Yermolinsky made this point too, that, again, that against e5, you're almost never going to leave the pawn hanging there, you're, you're going to play d5. So for example, a line like this, and if knight f3 or any other move, then after e5, you play here, since takes doesn't really work. Uh, however, I think I showed you <laughs> I showed you the actual move e5, which is a blunder that someone actually played against me once because it loses material to either knight d5 or even takes takes and knight d5. I think I played knight d5, and then he should sacrifice the exchange, but he doesn't have enough for it. 
Um, here's the point. The point is if he tries to protect this square, with, then he loses this pawn or a whole, maybe a whole bishop. I don't know. In any case, it's not good. <laughs> Things are not good here. So that's a blunder, e5, and I should have not <laughs> put that on the board. Excuse me. The principle, though, is right. I mean, the principle is that after, for example, this is a common move, and then e5. That happens a lot. That this is harmless. Blindfold chess is good for training, period. And I wish I'd maybe done more. And uh, leaving the Pawn there is, tends to be bad after h3 because when black attacks that pawn, this is normally a very nice position for white with a Meroxy bind kind of position. Blindfold chess is good for training, period. And I wish I'd maybe done more. But here, because you've played h3, there's major weaknesses over here. And that's a real problem. Knight g3, queen h4 check, bishop e5. Black may not be worse, but he's already definitely equal. Also, f5 might be coming. So that, I just wanted to correct that from last time. I'm having delay on my board here. So I can't get back. There we go. Okay, let's see if we can go back further. Um, okay, another question. I got a series of questions about the French Defense Dangerous Weapons book that I wrote. And um, my board is not responding quickly. These things happen. Um, there we go. Now we're back there. So, ooh, the streaming stopped again. Um, I'm assuming that you can't hear me since there's no streaming on. I'm going to quickly do something. Uh, .net. I'm going to try this. Now I'm getting a message. Sorry. Sorry about this. Apparently the streaming has gone back and forth. It's back. I see. Okay. I was actually running a little test here on the computer to see about my upload speed. And I will um, check that. Yeah, I think there's uh, some problems with the upload here. Well... There it is. Okay, let's see. Okay, I should be back now, I'm hoping. No, it says I was stopped. The upload speed is fine. I'm going to reset everything. Yeah, the upload speed is tremendous. Okay, so that's not it. Let me get out of there. Okay, back to here. Okay, let's hope this is working. And I don't see it streaming yet, but it could be that I'm on a delay. So I'm gonna start talking here and hope that things are working out. I don't see myself moving yet. Okay, so we were asked, I was asked questions about the Dangerous Weapons book, and in particular, I was asked about several lines um, that I mentioned that really nobody talks about <laughs> anymore, and whether they're still being played, and whether they're still any good. And here's here's one, here's the French defense. And one thing I talked about was this move. Now we already talked on this show about this move, which I've covered extensively in chess publishing, a move that's much better than it looks and uh, still is hanging in there quite well for black, I think. Um, I've played this over the board actually. Um, but this move is normally, now that's this move here is actually, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and, and this move is also played. Uh, but this move, after knight c3, is fairly rare. Now, it's more common than I thought. In the last couple of years, it's been played by quite a few 2400 and 25 players in the 2400s and 2500s. Um, let me talk about the main ideas. Maybe before I get to that, I should say that um, it's... Uh, well, let me, let me talk about the ideas. One, one idea here is that if... But um, let me get back here. Uh, this variation, for example, has been played, but it's not very good. White can take that. And it turns out he stands quite well here. A move like bishop c4 is good, for example. If white, if black plays knight h, h6 first, 
Yeah, I am at least getting this to come across, I think. It's still streaming, okay. If black plays h6 first, and white plays here, certainly the most natural move, and black plays here, now suddenly this move is legitimate. And in fact, it's one of the main lines, because if white takes, normally the knight would come here to g5 and attack there, but it can't do that. And if the knight goes here, of course, you simply lose this pawn, which is a valuable center pawn. So I guess the knight would have to retreat here, which and then black can just counterattack in the center and probably already stands better. This is not any fun for white at all. Black's breaking down your center and developing really quickly and has all sorts of nice squares. So, so in this position, white can't actually take that and it's gonna play something else. More common would be, for example, this move, and then black can play here, for example, pinning that. And this is just a whole nother a whole nother variation, but it's it's been it's held up very well for black in practice, and I think even in principle, in theory. Uh, what I noticed in recent games where you have twenty, where you have also twenty five and twenty six hundred just white, is a lot of them are playing this move, and black often plays this in response, which I think just isn't a very good move, because after this you can't come to e four, and this h six move looks pretty, pretty wasted. I think white's been playing this move now. And the idea is to reorganize after c5 with c3, then play unlike here. This has been played several times, this move a3, back. Now it turns out taking that just gives up too many light squares. In, in spite of the pawn structure, it looks very good for black. And then black should play like this and maybe bring the knight back. Now it turns out that there was, the, in this game, uh, black did all this and white did all this and black made the mistake of castling too early and getting attacked along uh, towards this side of the board, but he really should get these other moves in first, these moves in the center first, and maybe some light square moves, like getting the bishop onto some squares like that, or even to a6. It turns out there's no hurry to castle here. There's no big attack or anything. So I think this line's okay for black. Okay, that's the beginning of the answer to that. And so the question, the answer is yes, it's still being played, but of course it's still very much a sideline. Maybe, maybe I, I might try this as black. I think it doesn't have to be a sideline, but. Um, what else does white do besides bishop d3? If he plays here, we just have a typical position attacking the center, which can't be supported by c3. It's usually pretty comfortable. Um, if he plays, well, he can always take, but then this is actually a pretty useful move, h6, because you're gonna, in the exchange variation, it's very nice to put your knight here and not be worried about bishop g5. So this is there to be looked at, and it's probably at least as good as my book in terms of variations, I suspect, because he's specializing in that move. All right, now he also asked about this move, knight d2, a6. Uh, let me see if I'm getting some more some more questions, though, first. Let's get back to some more questions. You're back, it's I'm told. Uh, another French variation, so knight c3, knight c6. Yeah, that's the Hecht Riefschläger, and we talked extensively about that already. If you go back and look at earlier shows, I think we looked at that a lot. I played this uh, not that long ago, this move. And... Um, now, one of my thoughts is a funny question <laughs> uh, because it's too broad a question. It's like asking, what's your thoughts about knight f6 or something? I, I think it's still sound. I think that there are some drawbacks that if, from a practical point of view. For example, if white plays these kinds of lines, these boring lines with this, uh, I think black's equal, but it's, you know, it's not much fun. It's a, just like, a, it's one of the, it's an exchange French where unlike most exchange Frenches, black hasn't been able to make it completely unsymmetrical. So that's a bit of a drawback. Theoretically, it's doing fine. If you get the chess publishing, if you go to the chess publishing site, and if you're willing to pay for either just one column on the French, which is mine, or for all of the columns, uh, you'll see an amazing amount of theory on the Hector Riefschläger, which is what I call this 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 line. Because uh, the, my predecessor, Neil MacDonald, who's an author about the French, multiple books, I uh, love to analyze it, and then I've kept up the tr tradition. So it's the best source of any information about the Hector, about 3 knight c6. We have tons of analysis on that. Um, there is a fee to, to subscribe to the site, but I would look at that. And you can also go back and look at my French Dangerous Weapon, Weapons books where I, where I analyze this variation. And I think there are other sources, uh, other articles that are probably more recent, but not as thorough. Okay, um, what else do we have here? Oh, I'm supposed to not say go here, go there. You may just lose on that one, it's habit. What is your view? Okay, the same person asks another question. Um, so I might slow down on that. We talked about queen d4. <laughs> yeah, I used to recommend this to all my students. We already talked about queen d4 in the, I think, first 
broadcast early on, very early on, we talked about this. He's talking about this line. So I think I'll defer you back to that one because we probably have a lot of other material to cover. I'll come back to this if uh, if we get time, but more likely I'll do it either next week again, or you can go back and check out the uh, one of the very early shows, first or second ones. It's Fiddler and Carlson have played it, and it seems a de decent way to avoid masses of theory and aim for a Meroxy bind. Well, you can't really always get a Meroxy bind. Um, the Meroxy bind will come up in that position usually, as we talked about. I'm not going to repeat everything I said, but but in this line, you can also play a Meroxy bind, but I don't think you're going to enjoy it as much. This is very easy for Black to play. So what I talk about in my lecture series is this, which is a traditional way to attack very quickly in Castle. Okay. Um, who you fan just played Queen takes D4? I think I saw that. Uh, hey, John, can you go over a quiet solution to the Scandinavian for white that gives chances at a small edge? Thanks. Okay, I think against the Scandinavian, and what I've done when I was an E4 player, um, and I've studied it some because of students and things, uh, I think a good idea, assuming that, okay, now, first of all, there's two Scandinavians. The one most people play these days is that, so I assume you're talking about that one. And you can look into this, but I think it's an interesting line because because you've got the option of playing c4 and d5. Um, I'm trying to think of a good source for this. Someone recommends this as their move order uh, for white, and I uh, can't remember who it is. A book, a fairly recent book, recommends this as their move order. But uh, that's I would look into that delaying knight c3. It's safe, and it gives us. I think it gives a small edge just because I analyzed it a lot, and I never could quite equalize for black. However, it's a small edge. So it's not as though you get some major advantage. I'm sure you don't get any more than you do in the main lines. Um, great questions. What do you think about the Meroxy variation of the Dragon Sicilian Accelerated? You mean, meaning the Meroxy bind, I guess. Um, let me just see how much, let me move ahead because I could come back to that. The Catalan's a good opening, let me check here. What's your view? The Penrose variation, we, I think we too. Actually, oddly enough, I mentioned that indirectly. No, I didn't. Oh, I almost mentioned it earlier, so I'll talk about that. Well, let's let's go in order. I can get to these other questions next week if I have to, the ones that I got in advance. I'll try to get to as many questions as I can to the ones you sent me, because you sent me some great questions. The uh, accelerated Fianchetto in the, in the Dragon is playing uh, this move. Now, this move is the hyper-accelerated Fianchetto. We talked about, about this line uh, last week. Which I think is wonderful for white. Uh, the normal accelerated finchetto is to play this move, and it's as opposed to the dragon. The dragon goes like this. Most of you know this, but I'll just, and there's that queen d4 possibility. Um, this is the dragon, but you've already committed to d6. So the, in the accelerated dragon, uh, black decides he's not going to play d6 because he's going to reserve the idea of playing d5 later with one move. So it goes like this. And the point is, you just don't play d6 for a while. You play this move. And if white really uh, cooperates and plays the classical line, then you can at least equalize, at least according to the last theory I saw, with this move. And sometimes get an advantage. It's, it's not that easy to play for white. It's actually only equal if white plays well. But So you didn't waste time. d5 is the goal in the Sicilian anyway, if you can play it, because you've got two central pawns. e5 and d5 are big moves. So if you get that in for free, you're usually at least equal. The disadvantage, one of the disadvantages, the one that people will tell you about most anyway, is this move, which is the Meroxy bind. And the idea is that you're really clamping down on d5. So Black's idea of having a d5 in reserve is not as good. And you're not even going to be able to threaten d5 for a long time because white has such a clamp. And you've discouraged b5, which, as we all know, is a major civilian, uh, Sicilian, maybe civilian too, theme. Uh, here's how the, the main line usually goes, something like this. and Actually, I should be careful to say that. That's not really. The most popular line actually he plays knight f6 first, and then very often takes this. So there's two ways to play this. One is to set English opening. You have to understand how that goes. But basically, there's no way to. Uh, it's just a very good, well-placed piece. It can come there later. Sometimes it defends c4 going that way. But the main point is you're just going to develop very smoothly here. And, and because you and you've got more control of this, which turns out to be very, very important. And there's no doubling of your pawns. For example, a position like, um, let's see what we can do. If you played the knight back somewhere or something, uh, well, let's see what we're doing here. Maybe hmm, this can be not a very good example, maybe. But if you ever, there are lines where black plays for, 
this kind of move. And when this knight moves, then sometimes you can get your pawns doubled, that kind of thing. It's just very, it's nice to have the knight back there to start with. That was recommended, by the way, in Weapons Against the Sicilian or whatever it was called years ago by Quality Chess. They had a couple of editions of it, maybe even three, to play this move by a expert in the Accelerated Fianchetto. So this move here. Now, I guess you can't play that in this order, can you? So in this order, you're just counting on the fact that you like the lines with the queen here. You like you like to play these lines for white. And, um, and the Arkansas, well, let's play d6 first. So e5 can't happen. OK, so that's, that's a start of a question there. I would play this position gladly as white. Not thrilled with the black side of it, but you can't. One problem is it's a very professional try to draw opening as black, and it's hard to explain that. But it's very hard to get winning chances in the main lines. Uh, John, what are your thoughts about the Penrose variation of the modern Benoni? I haven't looked at it in years, but let me show you uh, what that is. OK, here's the modern Benoni again. Wonderful opening. It may not be that great, but okay. Now here's a case where you know White can avoid this, but then he gives up what the pen rose, the possibility of playing the pen rose. So the pen rose really comes up if Black is cooperative and allows this line. I didn't mention the exact order of the pen rose. I mentioned knight e2 g3, and I mentioned f4, and I mentioned bishop. I may have mentioned bishop g5. Um, but with the pen rose, it goes like this. It goes bishop d3 first. Now you can play the modern main line with these moves, which you have to prepare for. I don't know if I mentioned that, by the way. Um, or you can play this idea. And um, this is the Penrose. Now, as far as I know, if you follow exactly what's in my Gambit Guide to the Benoni from 10 years ago or so, which is completely out of date in almost every other line, I looked at it recently. I think it's still, almost what I said there is almost, is still true. There, there has to be some new theory, but it's not, there doesn't seem to be very much that's relevant. So if you want to look up my book on that, or just look at standard theory, I think you'll find it's okay. It's a very exciting opening for White. One of White's big ideas is to play, um, well, for both sides, one of White's big ideas, let me just make some more moves, is to play um, counterattacks with c4 and knight c5. So I think black's still just fine in this line. On the other hand, I haven't looked at it, say, any games in the last two years, so it may be, it may be okay. Um, why Carlson plays? Why Carlson plays against the Berlin defense? Very interesting. Why Carlson plays? That's not a complete question, but we'll see if we can guess what he's saying. This is the Berlin defense. I think we've mentioned it before. The most popular line at the very, very top, uh, because most people think they can draw the game as black if White plays into this main line, which goes like this. I think we looked briefly at this before. Okay. Now Carlson does play. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. Here and here, and it's an ending, but black has two bishops. Now, Carlson does play against this sometimes. He plays both white and black. I think you're talking about him as white, because it says against. And he is, like many, many top players, he has very often just avoided the whole question by playing there. Now, that's a sad thing to do in a way, because it, it stops you from playing d4 really early, which is what you usually want to do in the Roy Lopez. It also allows this bishop to come out comfortably instead, instead of having to go to e7, as it often does. On the other hand, white has scored pretty well with this, and it gives you all your normal Rui Lopez themes. Knight here, knight back, and knight to one of these squares, and d4 later. So for example, haha, I'm going to really get this wrong. I'm not an expert on this stuff at all, but uh, white might play castles first, and let's just play here or something. Oh, often, often, for example, Anand in the World Championship played bishop takes c6, and before that, he's played this a lot, this structure. He, he likes this a lot. Uh, but most, the original idea anyway, was more like playing something like this, and I'm going to just make some moves here, and and then maybe bring the knight around over here, and maybe play for d4 still. You, you're often going to have that position. You're not going to play bishop c6, and black's going to put his bishop back here. So that's what Carlson has played a lot against the Berlin, and so have a lot of other people. If you consider the Berlin just this move, which I guess I don't, I consider the Berlin defense after white plays this. But anyway, against two knight f6, People are avoiding the Berlin defense with that move. OK. Um, uh, do you think the King's Gambit is a playable opening for white? We, we had this question. I gave three answers to the, uh, oh, playable. Uh, yeah, actually, I, that wasn't quite the question. And I did answer, answer it as I talked about other things. I said it, it should be playable. There's a 
I don't know, 500 page book or something by John Shaw. One of you can correct me. It might be 600. I don't know about how to play the white side of this. Um, so it better be playable. And you are white after all. But I have to say that there are some main lines that I've been very suspicious about where maybe black gets just a, I kind of think black might get a tiny advantage. Now you can play here and get, I think, what's an equal game. That's called the bishop's opening. You can hope that your opponent plays here, and then you get this wonderful attack with knight f3. Not that it's a bad move, but it's White's very happy to see this. Uh, but in the main line, King's Gambit, I, I was always worried about these Kieseritsky lines with this and this, um, and maybe h6, and maybe just developing bishop g7. Uh, and I, I never saw those as being completely equal when I was thinking about recommending to my students as, as White. But um, it, I think in the books it's given is pretty equal, these kinds of things followed by this. And uh, you have to look up the theory. What I mentioned in my previous uh, in the previous show was that there are a bunch of fun lines that black can play to decline. Um, and one of them was this cute little move, which I think equalizes anyway. Uh, and another was I was talking about playing this, and then I mentioned this popular line here, but there are other ways to play this. I think you can play bishop c5 here too. We talked about that. You can go back and look at the earlier show. I can't remember which number it is, so I guess you have to watch all the shows, fast forward through them, and see and see if you can see these positions. So the overall answer though is that I think yes, it's playable, but I wouldn't really want to play it. I, I think it's, it's awkward. It's hard to play well if black knows what he's doing. I think it, you can do it, but um, but you really have to know what you're doing as white against some very specific lines. I also think there's some depressing facts about the King's Gambit. I think that's just dead equal. The King's Gambit declined. I know that white has these lines where now, now if black if white black plays here, I think that's good for white a little bit, tiny advantage. But if black just plays normal move here, what white usually ends up doing is some sort of um, now you play here because it'd be a waste of tempo to go there. White usually ends up playing some sort of knight here, but it turns out that even if you let him take that, I think it's just dead equal. Um, I just don't believe the knight a4 move is that great. So my opinion is this is all equal, and black has some dynamic chances too. This move is dangerous. So so to me it's a slightly depressing because it's hard for white to get good play against the declined variation. Playable almost for sure. It's probably fully equal for white, but but only that, without, without maybe that many prospects. Okay, P.H. Nielsen, very good. David Franklin said it was P.H. Nielsen's recommending Knight C2 in the Experts Against the Sicilian series. Yeah, from the, I think from the very first edition, he recommended uh, Knight C2. Thank you. Um, can you tell us about thinking methods when we have to calculate a lot? My favorite thing to tell my students is the very first thing to do is before you make your move, don't even worry about what he's doing. See if you have any direct... Uh, checks, captures, or forcing moves that might lead to just a win. So make sure you start in the right place. Don't, don't When your opponent makes a move, don't just sit there and go, oh, what's he doing? Or what's he trying to do to me? Or what's he threatening? The very first thing you do uh, when you want to calculate is say, do I have some forcing moves or do I have some sequence that puts him on the defensive? Because after all, if you do, you don't have to worry about what he's planning or any tactics that he might be playing. Then next thing I do is I use the candidate uh, move technique which I think most top players do. You try to locate the moves that are that you think are best, and you start out with, uh, as I say, your most forcing moves, your most the moves that are most tactical and most direct. And at that point, there's all kinds of things that all kinds of supposed methods you can use to calculate. But every time I read a book about it, I don't see anything very useful. I think I think once you get started, try to be as systematic as possible. Try not to look at lines two or three times once you've decided they aren't any good, or even if they are good, you want to make sure you don't get in time trouble just grinding over the same positions again and again. But basically, you just get better by doing a lot of it. You can do tactical exercises. Um, I probably calculate too much as a player. I tend to just calculate a way to, because that's the way I feel like I can understand the position. I just keep looking at moves in my head, and then I'll get a feel for the kind of positions that are resulting. The problem is it's time consuming. So I don't use my instincts enough. One maybe key thing to remember is when should you be calculating? And we did talk about that, I think, in an earlier show. You don't want to calculate too much unless there's an open or some kind of position where there may be a fair number of exchanges or tactics going on. If it's a calm position, you might want to save your time and maybe even make a second best move if you have to. You would, Not intentionally, but just... When you've got three or four moves that are roughly of the same value, maybe it's not that important to find the exact one and calculate it out fully. 
And then the last piece of advice I'd have would be that before you make your move, look at direct attacking moves and calculate it. Make sure right before you, you've already decided on a move and right before you make it, be careful, something I didn't always do, be careful to, um, to check for direct tactics against it. Cal in other words, before you make your actual move, do a bunch of calculating, pretending you're on the other side of the board for a second before you actually dare to actually move the piece. That's not much of an answer. I think my overall answer is that calculation is an art that you develop or you're lucky enough to have tremendous talent with to begin with. And it just takes a lot of practice and um, concentration. So I'm afraid I'm afraid that thinking methods, that's tough. You can there are a lot of books out there you can you can look at, but I, I've never been very convinced. Okay. Ah, Franklin says that the F4 F5 is called the seal or sweeper. It's nice to know. I don't know if that's the Hans Kamak term or or not. Um, no, Carlson played bishop c6 against Anand. Yeah, okay, but I think Anand has played bishop c6 repeatedly, so he may have picked that up from Anand. You, you can look it up in the database. I'm almost positive that you'll see that that move, um, e even if, really with players on both sides of the board. Um, give it a try. Take a look. I could be wrong. I'm often wrong. I love your book, Play the French. Thanks for writing it. Oh, that's a great comment. I like that. More of those. Keep sending more of those. Um, and that's the end of the chat questions for a second. And let me see about my total time here, which I'm now a bit confused about because of when we started and the delays in the streaming. I think we're close to the end of the time. So what I think I'll do is show one more, one more question that I got. Let me show a game really quickly. I got a question about, let me make sure I get the right game. I'm gonna put up a game here. I got a question about the Grunfeld and I should give a really long, complete answer, so maybe I'll give more of it next week, but let's at least get started with it. Um, it's a game between Yakovenko and Nav Navarra, two 2700 players. Uh, the question was, the, topic, the latest topical line in the Queen B3 Grunfeld goes, that's the Grunfeld, and the Queen B3 line, also called the Russian variation, or traditionally called the Russian variation, runs like this. And the question is, oh, here's the line. There, these are normal moves. It's funny, knight c6 was recommended by Rousen in his book years ago when it wasn't a main move. Then everybody decided they didn't like it very much, and now it's a huge line. And this, I believe, I hope I get this one right. This one, um, Carlson did play against Anand in the World Championship. Please don't tell me I'm wrong. Um, probably am. But at any rate, that's the main move against it. And now this gambit that Black plays. Black plays a sort of interesting idea that um, has become a very, very popular instead of just um, developing uh, more pieces. And this move. So you know, you see here that black's giving up a pawn. Now that's a nice outpost on d4, so you're not going to uh, not take it. White really has to take the pawn. Now white's a pawn up, and black counterattacks in the center. And one idea is to tear open some lines and play rook over and attack here, just get very fast development. Um, so white, in this game plays this move. That is the most common move. You'd have to look at the theory. We're not going to spend a lot of time, especially because we're at the end of the show here, on, on alternatives. But the idea is to get out of the way of this, for one thing. There's going to be a discovered attack pretty soon on that queen. And um, well, already, for example, knight takes d5 is threatened, winning a pawn, winning the pawn back. So white gets out of the way. And now black has two moves, b5, which maybe I'll talk about next time. I think b5 might be objectively best. The idea is you give up another pawn and you just get a lot of development. It's a fascinating line, and I'm not really sure. The question, one question is, is this sound? Is this pawn sacrifice good? Is it sound for black? And my impression is, is that it is sound. Maybe white gets a tiny advantage if he plays perfectly, but I looked at a lot of lines, and I think this line's okay. And actually, I think the way that Navarro played in this game is also okay for black. He took and played there. This goes back many, many years. I think rook e8 used to be played first. No, that's not right. I think bishop f5 is always played. Now, white's a full pawn ahead, but that pawn can be very weak. And I think that happens in the game. Uh, and rook e8 is another move that's very interesting. And uh, let me just see if I wrote some notes on this. I did, but I don't have them right in front of me. Let me just see. Yeah, let me just talk about it in general. The idea is that these bishops are sweeping down on the queen side. 
that pawn has to be protected down there. And black has a nice uh, tempo winner on the queen, so he's attacking. This bishop's kind of passive and can be exposed to another tempo winning attack with rook e8. So white's got a lot to think about, how to hold on to this pawn and how to kind of get all his pieces out. And in this game, it's too bad I don't have all my notes here. Now, he doesn't have to play there. There are earlier games of this variation, by the way. In fact, there's one game that goes way back to 1967, <laughs> something, some really, really old Ullman game. But um, so all this stuff goes way back, but this is sort of a modern way of playing it. And now he's attacking the pawn already. So white really has to play there, as it turns out, uh, if he doesn't want black to equalize. He can try other moves, but it just, like for example, taking here, but it's, it's just risky to do that. I think black might start out even with this move rook here, because he's going to end up getting pressure this way. So it's not just that he's taking the pawn with tempo, it's that he's also attacking. So I think that's really a bad pawn to take. This may give white a tiny advantage. So I'll just show the game, because I really need to close up the show. But um, now, here's the deal. This is, white's a clear pawn up, but it's hard for him. The, the, set, the second rank is vulnerable. Black's going to have a nice active, uh, this, uh, this rook can go to open one of these open files. And so black's a little ahead in development, and white, if white moves this bishop here, at some point black might be threatening to just take that pawn and split up black's queenside pawns as well as winning his pawn back. So I'll just show the game. This this has, a, that's too bad. I think I'll talk about this next week. We'll, we'll look at this next week. We'll just show the game this week. So he immediately tries to get the queens off, and this ending is very interesting. Now, you don't have to play queen f6, but this ending is interesting because it resembles very closely uh, an ending in the Benoni that you get, a mainline, modern main Benoni, where this pawn is left and white's a pawn ahead, but it just turns out that eventually that pawn is too weak and black's able to draw. Uh, the same thing can happen if the queens stay on the board. The same kind of thing can happen in this sort of ending, where even though black doesn't win this back quickly, he eventually gets enough pressure to either win it back or get a drawn endgame. One problem with lines like this is that um, only white is trying to win if you have decent players playing. And you can see why. I mean, what's House Black ever going to win this? Even if he did win this pawn, it would just be dead equal. And white would be ahead in development, probably. Okay, so black attacks that pawn. White defends it. Now, this means that he should have played probably here. I think that was recommended. Sort of obvious, isn't it? But I think he was scared of having this hanging in some line. It turns out this is better. And I think white has a small advantage here. One problem is that it's, it's so, sort of impossible to win a lot of these end games. At any rate, he played this way. And from now on, I think black is equal. He gets to the seventh rank. He even has attacking chances now. So maybe black can think about getting some winning chances. Black plays back. I'm trying to remember why that is exactly. Um, let me see. Queen here. Is, oh, yeah. Queen here is just so that's not with tempo. And if black does take this, I guess white can go down and take these two. But I think that's only going to be equal. So what else can white do here that worries people. Hmm. He's not on that square. So it could be that this is okay for black. Somehow I feel like white has a small advantage here, but I'm not sure why. Maybe just d6. Oh yeah, because the queen can support that pawn from c6, and then the rook can come here, and maybe, maybe d7 will happen by force. That's why he plays bishop f8. Interesting. Well, I learned something. So instead of, uh, since he can't play d6 anymore and support the pawn with moves like d7 and rook over, aiming at that square. He now just starts grabbing pawns. But the problem with that is that everything gets liquidated. So he plays d6 anyway. He probably has other ways of keeping a little bit of pressure, but it turns out it turns out all these lines are essentially equal. Now there's a kind of a nice finish here. Looks like white's making progress. This is why white played this way. Looks very dangerous, doesn't it? But it turns out he simply defends that. Now it's a drawn rook endgame. This rook is active and that's even material. So white was hoping that he could get some, uh, distract the queen or get some pressure based on that pin. He plays there. The only problem with that is there's no threat because this is, well, there is a threat, but not, not after black's move. Black plays there. And now the problem is if you take the queen, uh, there's a mate on the last rank, mate in two. So, so this g5 move is very ingenious because if white starts taking off these pieces, it's just a drawn end game. And so he plays there. Just, oh, and also black has a threat of taking here on f2. Oh, and I should say, it was a very clever move, rook c1, because if check here, there's no longer any way to protect here. So, and this is defending g2. 
So it was a clever move, rook c1. It just didn't work because of the counter clever move here. And now white has to return to protect, and you can imagine this game just ends up being drawn. In fact, black plays a perpetual attack on the queen. Wherever the queen goes, black has a square to oppose it. Here, c5, here, here, or here, here. <laughs> and so they draw the game very quickly, maybe even right now. One more move. Yeah, they just repeat. Okay, so that game was drawn. Fascinating game. I wish I could spend more time on it. Maybe we'll look again next week. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll, we'll hopefully continue with a lot of these things. I have a lot of extra questions next week. So thank you very much. Tell your friends. Come back. Any question you want, any question your students want to ask, send me an email to the um, address that I mentioned earlier, askiamwatson at chessclub.com. You can also message me at John L. Watson. Uh, just send a message, message space, John L. Watson. That's my ICC account. And we also have a Twitter tag. So thank you, everybody. It was fun and great questions as usual.